What we're going to talk about today is a topic that we hear a lot about in the insurance industry. I've, I'm sure you've heard about this in other presentations at other events you've been at. Generally, we talk about it as post-mortem tax planning. It can sound like a very complicated subject, but I'm going to try to make it as simple as possible for you. So what do we mean by post-mortem tax planning? Sounds obvious. Let's do someone's tax planning after they're dead. Isn't that contrary to everything we learn in the insurance industry? We do planning while people are young and healthy and can answer decisions and pass medical tests. But we've got this strange tax system that allows us in Canada to do some planning for the client to result in lower taxes after they're gone. And in fact, we're forced to do these things because of some things in, in the features of our tax system. So where does it all begin? And what's the nature of the problem? Let's understand that first of all, because I think you'll understand this in a way that it, you'll realize that it affects all your clients. It starts with the reading of the will. Someone dies, your client has died. Everyone gets together at the lawyer's office, sits around a big table. Everyone's sad, but they wanna know what's in the will. So they start reading the will, and there's almost always gonna be a clause, and I say 95% of the time or more, that looks something like this. A residual clause that says, I leave my assets to my spouse, and if my spouse predeceases me, I leave my assets to my children in equal shares, assuming you like your children. Now, I call this the residual clause because you may have other clauses in there that say specific things like I give the cottage to this person, I give, I give this business to that person, I give my jewelry to this person, um, but there's always going to be a residual clause and most of the time the residual clause catches a number of things that we hope it doesn't catch. The big one is corporate shares. So for most of us, a lot of our clients have private corporations, could be a hold co, investment hold co, a realty hold co, could be an operating business, could be multiple corporations. And if they've got this general clause in their will and they don't deal with the shares specifically, it's gonna capture those shares. So what's the problem? Leaving it to your spouse is fine. I leave this to my spouse, but if my spouse predeceases me, I leave it to my kids. So now we've suddenly got a tax problem just inherent in our tax system. Because what's gonna happen is mom and dad are gonna die with a capital gain and the kids are gonna pay tax on the same assets. So the, what we're gonna talk about today is this double tax on death. We wanna fully understand that this is a problem that most of our clients face, the potential for double taxation. We wanna talk about the planning options, those post-mortem tax planning options that are available within our Income Tax Act with some clever lawyers and accountants to at least turn it into a single tax instead of a double tax problem. And then lastly, we're gonna talk about where we come in, providing insurance options for the client to address the residual tax that's going to be there. And how do we pull these things together and work together with the, the lawyers and accountants for the clients to get the best solution for the clients? So let's talk about the double taxation. First thing that happens, mom and dad have died. So this is on a joint last basis because you've got the rollover to the spouse possible with that clause. But if, if mom and dad is predeceased and the last spouse, mom or dad is surviving and then dies, the trigger of the capital gains on death. Basic stuff. If you were to simply transfer the shares under the will to your kids, whether to one child, whether to all the children equally, or even to a trust for the kids, how are the kids gonna access any of the value? The only way they're gonna be able to do that is to liquidate assets within the corporation or sell the business and ultimately withdraw assets from the corporation. And when they withdraw assets from the corporation under our tax system, that's treated as a dividend. So mom and dad pay a capital gains tax on the value within that corporation and kids pay a dividend tax on the exact same value. And that's the nature of the double tax problem that can happen with that simple will clause that's in 95% of our clients' wills and will affect all of them eventually. So in a worst case scenario, and these are Ontario rates, they'll be similar in Nova Scotia and other maritime provinces, you could have a tax approaching 75% when you combine the two together if you do no planning whatsoever. So the question is, how do we avoid this? What can we do? For the lawyers and accountants, particularly the accountants, they want to jump to what are known as the postmortem planning options. Now the first one, called loss carryback planning, has been around for pretty well as long as there's been capital gains around, so 50 years. Pipeline planning is a newer thing. That's been around, I guess you could do it for quite some time, but it's been really popular, let's say in the last decade. Each of these methods will move you from a double tax problem to a single tax problem it's a question of now, what is the tax you're gonna pay? 
Okay, so I want to explain each of these planning options in turn. Loss carryback, trying to simplify it, nothing complicated here. After your death, you give the shares to your kids. And rather than having the shares go to the kids, you have the corporation redeem the shares. So let's say the corporation's got a lot of cash and it's just a holding company. Don't give the shares to the kids of the holding company, expect them to take the cash out. Use the cash to redeem the shares. When you redeem shares under our tax system, it's treated as a dividend. The shares disappear and it's treated as a, as a dividend. So the person who receives the dividend is taxed the dividend tax rate. And that would be the estate. So we're gonna redeem those shares from the estate. Have we solved anything? No, at this point, because mom and dad die with a capital gains problem. A state has a dividend tax problem rather than the kids. Nothing is solved at this point. But a feature of our tax system says that the redemption of those shares makes them disappear and the estate which now owns those shares at the fair market value they're worth and has a cost base that's bumped up to whatever that fair market value is. Mom and dad had a low cost base, high value. They had a capital gain. Shares go to a state. A state has high value, high cost base. It gets to bump its cost base up so that you don't pay the capital gains twice. So when those shares disappear on redemption, and by redemption I mean the corporation is buying the shares back, and something that can be kind of confusing when you start to read some literature is in the US corporations can buy their shares back and those shares go into treasury. In Canada when we buy the shares back, the shares are redeemed and they disappear. So. If the estate loses those shares, the estate gets to claim a capital loss. The estate has a dividend tax to pay on the redemption, but it also gets a capital loss because it had high value shares that disappeared with high cost base. And the key thing in the rules is that as long as you create that loss within one year following the death, you can carry back that loss to offset the capital gain in the deceased final return. So it becomes a wash. So we went from having a double tax problem with mom and dad having a capital gain, kids having a dividend tax, to a single tax issue where mom and dad's capital gain is wiped out by the capital loss, and all we're left with is the dividend to the estate. So we've reduced the tax liability from maybe 73% down to 48%. For most accounts, that's good enough. They think, okay, I've solved the double tax problem, I've done a little post-mortem planning, we haven't done what's in the will, We've done something different and we've reduced the tax. Job done, send them the bill. Some accountants got smart and said, there's a better way to do this. We can get the tax rate even lower. And that's where the pipeline plan comes in, the more recent type of planning. So again, just like in the first instance, at death, the second death, there's the triggering of the capital gains. Mom and dad have to pay that capital gain, call it 27%, okay? But instead of redeeming the shares, what we're gonna do is the estate's gonna take control of those shares instead of giving it to the kids as under the will. State's gonna take control of the shares. And the estate is gonna create a new corporation, a new holding company, and the estate is gonna sell the old corporation to the new corporation in return for a promissory note that's owed to the estate. And it may eventually then amalgamate the two corporations into one and the assets are available there, could liquidate assets, let's say, holding company, cash assets, something like that, liquidate them, and use the assets to pay out to the estate on the note, to, re to repay the promissory note. So the money flows from the corporation to the estate as a repayment of a promissory note, not as a dividend. So there's no dividend tax payable, but also there's no capital loss created at the estate level. So nothing available to carry back to offset the capital gain that mom and dad suffered. So again, we've gone from one tax, from two taxes to one tax, but we left ourselves with the capital gains tax. Now this is much more preferable to the accountants because they say, hey, the capital gains tax rate is so much lower than the dividend tax rate. I've done an even better job. I can charge even higher fees. So the accountants, think they've solved the problem. They've eliminated the double tax problem. And by going to pipeline, they've reduced the taxes as far as they think they can. You're stuck with the capital gains. There was no way to avoid it. Here it is. At least you don't have a double tax problem. However, it's important to note that not every client will do a pipeline plan. Some of them 
IR, they're not that sophisticated, or their accounting help or legal help are not that sophisticated. Or they may actually be a type of business, and there are some types of businesses that can't do a pipeline. CRA will not let them do it. Or um, the idea of pipeline planning may have disappeared. Okay? So I say that because back in six years ago, that went fast, 2016, when the federal government came in and introduced a lot of tax changes, you know, the tax on split income, TOZI, uh, there were a lot of proposals floating around that year. And one of the proposals was to completely eliminate pipeline planning. And through the back and forth with the industry and in the media and everything, there was some pushback from business owners, from accountants, from lawyers. And by the end of the year, they backed off that part of the, the tax proposals. But certainly it's on their radar to eliminate that possibility. Because if the government is only going to collect one tax, they're going to want to collect the dividend tax, not the capital gains tax, because it's much higher. And when you think about it, it makes perfect sense. In our tax system, a big part of it is anti-avoidance rules. You know, we, whenever there's a loophole, the government tries to close it. And the big one is the general anti-avoidance rule, GAR. And GAR says that whenever there's a transaction or a series of transactions that are undertaking for no other purpose than to reduce tax, then it can be attacked by CRA using GAR. And how could pipeline be seen as anything other than that? Mom and dad, the taxpayers are dead. They're gone. And after the fact, some fancy accounts and lawyers come up with the idea of, hey, we'll create a new corporation. We'll, we'll sell the old corporation, the new corporation. We'll get a promissory note. We'll, we'll pay out a promissory note. And instead of paying dividend tax, we'll only pay the capital gains tax. It's, it's exactly what GAR was designed to cover, a series of transactions for no other purpose, no business purpose, no other purpose than to reduce tax. So it's certainly the kind of thing that could be open to GAR, although CRA to date has not been applying GAR in these situations in straightforward pipeline plans. And in fact, many people that do pipeline plans for the past several years have made sure they weren't going to be covered by this by going to CRA in advance of acting on the plan and getting an advanced tax ruling. An advanced tax ruling is nothing more than saying to CRA, this is what we're going to do for this particular client at this particular time. Are we okay without paying a penalty tax on this? And the CRA people look at it and they say, yes, we'll sign off on that one. It's got no precedential value. It doesn't mean another taxpayer similarly situated would be covered off by that or a taxpayer in some other circumstance would be covered. It just means that for your particular transaction, they're going to allow it to happen without coming after you. But they could change their mind at any time. Just say we're not either giving advanced tax rulings or you've done it without an advanced tax ruling and we're going to come after you using whatever tools are available to us. You may have screwed up the transaction in some way, the, the mechanics of it. If you didn't get it exactly right, they can find a loophole to go after you. Um, or if they decide at some point to change the legislation, things like that. So pipeline planning is nice because it gives us the lower rate of tax but it's not necessarily going to be there in the future. And my own personal opinion is that at some point in the not too distant future, it will disappear. There's a lot of movement in the tax world that says that, you know, a lot of the problems we have with aggressive tax planning is driven by the fact that there's a high dividend tax rate and there's a low capital gains tax rate. So we either increase the capital gains tax rate by increasing the inclusion rate from 50% of assets uh, gains to maybe 75%. Or we tighten up the rules on pipeline planning to prevent people from making these kind of transactions. So when we're doing planning for a client today, talking about a death that'll occur 30 years in the future, we'd be making a big bet if we were saying you're going to be able to do a pipeline plan. So from our perspective, talking to the clients while they're alive, we have to keep their minds open to the idea that anything can happen in the future. Position yourself today for the best possible result in the future based on what we know or what we suspect. Give yourself some flexibility. For the accountants doing post-mortem planning today, meaning your clients have already died, they'll take whatever they can get today. If they can get the pipeline through today, they'll get it through today, okay? But they may not be able to get it through next year or the year after. So the one thing I say, what will the accountants do? I've found many situations where advisors are working with the clients and the clients are running things by their account. And you've introduced the idea of using insurance to meet state tax requirements. And the accountant will say something like, unknowing, un not having a full understanding of what the possibility of insurance is, say something like, oh no, don't, you don't need that, we've taken care of it, we're gonna be doing a pipeline plan, or we're gonna be doing post-mortem planning generally. 
And so your client comes back to you and says, my accountant says I don't, don't need that insurance stuff because they've got it covered. They're gonna do this fancy planning. And that's just a miscommunication because I'm here to tell you that if they do their fancier planning and we do the insurance planning, the combined result will be much better. And that's what we wanna to try to achieve. And our challenge is to not only have you understand it, be able to communicate it in a very simple way to your clients so they understand it, but even be able to take it that step further if you need backup, and we'd be here to support you with that, to go to their accountants and explain it to them. Because the accountant may not have the experience with insurance that's necessary to, to fully appreciate it. So where we come in is funding the tax liability. Because remember, if you go from a double tax problem to a single tax problem, you still have a tax problem. It may just be a different size, right? So we know from our experience that corporate owned insurance can be a very good planning opportunity for your clients, not only to pay the tax, to provide them liquidity when necessary to pay the tax, but in some cases it can actually reduce the tax payable, okay? And that's my middle point, very important point. I use that with the clients all the time in meetings. I use it with accountants all the time in meetings. We've determined through all the planning you've done that there's a tax liability of $9 million. But if we buy $9 million of insurance and put it in the, in the corporation in order to give you the liquidity so you don't have to sell assets or sell the business to pay the tax, the fact that you've got $9 million in the corporation in insurance will actually mean you'll pay, nine million, you'll pay less than $9 million worth of tax. It might only be $7 million worth of tax. That's the check the CRA will get, actually a smaller check. And it all depends on the type of planning and the type of the way the insurance is used. So I'm using those numbers because I'm thinking of a case I just worked on this past week. We presented to a woman who was 78. She's the survivor, her, her husband has died. They have a large trucking company in the Toronto area. And um, they've done a freeze. Her shares of the company are worth about $36 million and she's got a $9 million tax liability associated with those shares. She's 78, can we do anything for her? She actually happens to be very fit. We've run her through underwriting and uh, she can get the insurance. Now we're trying to convince them it's a good idea. And part of convincing them it's a good idea was to show them that if we buy $9 million of insurance in the corporation to provide her with the liquidity to actually pay the tax, she's gonna end up with paying tax that in this case was uh, about a million and a half less, okay? For different clients, it could be different situation. All depends on the size of the CDA credit. Unfortunately, at 78, she's not getting anywhere near a full CDA credit. She'll be lucky to get about 60% of the death benefit as CDA credit at that point. But it's still gonna work for her it, compared to the alternatives. Now, where the savings comes from is the fact that, remember I said in loss carryback planning, you're gonna leave yourself with a dividend. You're gonna get rid of the capital gain by creating a capital loss, carry back the loss to offset the gain. You're leaving yourself with a dividend tax. Well, we know that anytime you have to pay a dividend tax, better to pay capital dividends through CDA because then the dividends to the extent that you use CDA can be tax free. Now you may recall from years ago, other presentations that there sometimes can be a limit on that. You know, the so-called 50% rule a 50% solution. You may find your ability to use all the CDA is limited depending on how much insurance you got, depending on the value of the assets, value of the shares. But in any event, we're creating CDA, we're creating the opportunity to make some of the dividend, some of that deemed dividend on redemption tax free and therefore we are going to pay dividend tax, but we're going to pay dividend tax on a smaller number, which will reduce the overall tax size. In pipeline planning, what's different is we're not paying a dividend. We're letting mom and dad have the capital gain and we're paying out through promissory note. So we're not going to actually use the CDA for mom and dad's estate, but that CDA is still valuable. It's still sitting in the corporation and it's available to extract other assets from the corporation either then or in the future. So the CDA, even in the pipeline plan, creates value for the client. And they wouldn't have this value had they not used insurance. And remember, we gotta think about back to how do people fund their insurance, their tax liabilities? If you've got a business, you've really only got four choices. One, start saving the money now and hope you live long enough to save enough, the sinking fund idea. Two, at the time of the death, you could sell a lot of assets pay the tax that'll be triggered on that. Try to net enough to actually pay your tax bill on your shares. Three, you can borrow the money so you can encumber the business. And we talked about that with this trucking company. They've got a lot of assets, but do they wanna take on a significant debt 
when mom dies, and remember she's 78, that could be in the next 12 years realistically. And they didn't want to take on the debt. So insurance became the only practical solution, that fourth solution. It's great because it provides liquidity exactly when it's needed. The money will be delivered the moment mom dies, not before, not after. And then it's got all these tax benefits. And we can run the numbers to show them, her, the accountants, that it was much more efficient. Now this meeting we had, we sat on a board table, and the board table was, the boardroom was as big as this room. And the board table was almost as long as this room. We had the CFO, we had the, the son who's running the business, the CF, CEO now, the mother, the prior lawyer to the corporation, who was still there as a valuable opinion. She's sort of retired uh, lawyer now, tax lawyer, but she was there to provide opinion. The current tax lawyer, another accountant was on Zoom, and um, uh, some, some people from Deloitte and Touche were in the room, Deloitte's. So, um, you know, this can be, can be complicated and it can be um, intimidating if you get into these situations where you're the sole insurance person going in there. So the advisor in this case, who's very experienced, took me to the meeting as well to help address some of these, these issues when we talked about uh, how the insurance would dovetail with some of the planning they were doing. And he already got them to the point where they realized that of those four options for paying the tax liability, insurance was gonna be the only one that really worked for them. Um, but arming yourself with a little bit of this information, you don't have to become an expert, you're not gonna become an accountant, God help you, you won't become a lawyer. But uh, at least you understand the lingo and you can say with confidence to your clients, you need to have the insurance too. Don't let the accountants convince you that doing the planning is all they need to do. The insurance has to be a part of that. So let's prove it to ourselves, and then talk about as insurance specialists, well, what type of insurance? What do we do? How do we present this? What do we, what do we go to them with? So what I've got here is a very simple case study to demonstrate how of all the several product options we've got, they're all gonna create value for the client. One may be more efficient than another, depending on the search situation. It depends on the type of planning that's ultimately done. And remember, we don't know the type of planning that's ultimately gonna be done. This is post-mortem planning. You're talking to the client today at 78. When she's 92 and dies, what's available then? What are the tax rates then? How smart are the lawyers and accountants then? So we're, we're just setting her up for success, setting the company up for success. But that makes our job a little confusing because we might say, well, do I do like a T to 100 type product? Do I do a whole life? Do I do, a, you know, if I do a whole life or, or a UL, do I, what, do I do a quick pay? Do I do a life pay? Do I use enhancement on a whole life product? Do I use other features that might be available in the UL product? I mean, how do I decide what's gonna give the best value? We're used to just going and saying, what's life expectancy? Compare different product options, see which gives the best internal rate of return or the best death benefit at a specific age. We say, oh, this one has more cash value, this one's less, but we care about death benefit here. What's gonna give me the highest death benefit at age 92? But in a corporate situation, that may not always be the best product because there are other circumstances like the CDA credit. Different products can create, or at least have in the past created, very different CDA credits at specific ages. So if CDA credit's important to us, that might affect us how we choose the products. Um, some clients, depending on their corporate structure and what they're doing, are concerned about having too much uh, passive assets or cash value inside their corporation inside a life insurance policy. So they may lean towards products that have less cash value. It all depends on the situation. In a case where the person's done a freeze, like this lady, her shares are set, they're in stone. They, we know the value of them. So any additional value added to the corporation will not change the value of her shares. We know what her tax liability is gonna be. That's why we call it a freeze. So let's try to investigate some of these things. And this is where we'll sort of get to where you understand or seen this stuff regularly. So I'm gonna go through it real fast. The first thing I want you to know, don't pay attention to the numbers per se. I just wanna show you the methodology. An actuary at Sun Life created a spreadsheet initially to try to figure out versus alternatives, investments, meaning not insurance, what you would have to earn in order to do just as well as the insurance net of all the corporate effects. 
And so we take something in life expectancy through iteration. We take something in life expectancy, and in this case, life expectancy, uh, the insurance was producing 1.7 net to a state IRR, 1.7 percent at age 85 for this 65-year-old. And so making it the same 1.7 on this side gave us a number over here, alternative investment rate 10.5%. So if someone said to me, I'm going, I know I'm going to live to 85. I can guarantee it. Um, should I buy insurance or not? Or just invest the money myself? We would say to them, well, if you could earn 10.5% or better on your investments, the premium dollars you would have given me every year for the rest of your life, then go ahead and save your money. You'll do better off saving for yourself. If you can't guarantee yourself that investment and guarantee that you'll live to 85, then you got to buy the insurance. So this was the first iteration of a spreadsheet to try to help us calculate these things. Subsequently, and subsequent to the production of this presentation, we've now come out in the last year with a very sophisticated illustration capability to be able to show to the clients the value of insurance in respect of these post-mortem planning options. It compares different types of products. It also compares different types of planning, loss carryback versus no planning versus post-mortem planning. And it helps you as the advisor working with the client and their accountants to try to zero in on what makes sense. And part of that illustration capacity is to be able to show it year by year, not just at a certain point in time. So this you can see, we, we got this number by forcing the spreadsheet to give us the same number on both sides. But this one's more, more dynamic. It does all the calculations. And it accounts all that stuff with the tax situation for post-mortem versus uh, loss carryback. It's more sophisticated in some of the inputs you can put in for the products and can show multiple products. Like you can show, like here we're only showing one insurance option, one planning option. So you can see here, this is an example with whole life and using loss carryback planning. Let's see how it runs. The new illustration capability will actually show you no planning, loss carryback planning, pipeline planning, and it can show you to cross as many products as you want to do, okay? It draws graphs so that you can just let the graphs say that product's best at that age. Very handy. But let me summarize some results. And these results are from a few years ago. The pricing on some products has changed. So in this example, we just took a, uh, I think it was a 50-year-old male non-smoker. And we looked at a bunch of product options and said, okay, this is sort of a universe of permanent product options we might have at Sun Life. Um, and I've ordered them in terms of premium. So it could be as little on a life pay UL, essentially min funded. It's showing 1.5% here, but ignore that because it's min funded. 15,000 a year. All the way up to the Cadillac, a 10 pay whole life, 50,000. So we got a pretty wide range of premium amounts depending on the product options we choose. The other product options that are here are whole life pay with enhancements, so like a term enhancement early on in the contract to try to get the premium down. Dropped it down about 10,000, the premium. Uh, we've got a UL 10 pay versus the life pay. We've got a regular whole life, and this is a UL life pay with a, a feature that's, I think, unique to Sun Life. It's called, a, it's called an ACB benefit. Think of it as a rider. What it does is it, if you're not going to get a full CDA credit because you died at the wrong time, it'll pay additional death benefits. So you get the sort of term coverage to pay additional death benefit to the extent of whatever your ACB is. So if you're looking for X amount, five, this is $5 million, X, $5 million of coverage, you want a $5 million CDA credit, if you choose this option, you always get a $5 million CDA credit, okay? So, and you can see there's a cost to that, right? It's another three grand more. But the CDA credit might be real important to you. On the death benefit side at age 85, life expectancy, we get what we expect. On the products that are essentially min paid, the UL, whether it's life or 10 pay, you got your 500,000 plus a little, little marginal extra because you're paying annually instead of monthly. And on the whole life contracts, you've got some growth up to, up to as high as 760,000 and there are different amounts in the 700s. Um, the UL life pay with ACB benefit actually has a death benefit of almost 600,000. Why? Because the ACB death benefit actually paid out in this particular client at age 85. So you got more than the $500,000 death benefit. You got almost another 100,000 in death benefit added in. So the extra 3,000 in premium is easily justified. So those are the product options we're going to start with. Give us our, our range of typical things we would see in the industry from any company. 
Now we've got to cross-reference those same product options against the planning options. Remember, our two planning options that are available from the accountants are the loss carryback or the pipeline. And our measure in this case is that IRR equivalent rate of return. What would I have to earn on the same premium dollars if I set it aside and I lived 85, guaranteed, guaranteed 85, guaranteed to get the return every year, what would my rate of return have to be? What's my hurdle rate? And these are the numbers. So when I look across that, I can see, first of all, the insurance seems to work better in the loss carryback plan than it does in the pipeline plan because these numbers are generally bigger than these numbers. Well, half and half, I guess. Um, and why is that? Because you're using the CDA credit over here on the loss carryback, and remember, you're not using the CDA credit immediately on the pipeline, but you still have the excess CDA sitting in the corporation. Now, what's interesting about this more recent illustration capability we have is we actually do accounting for the excess CDA. That gets factored into the decision making as well, and that hasn't been done in the past. And so if I look at these products, I'd say, you know what, if I was doing a loss carryback, just purely on the numbers, and if I knew everything was gonna work this way, I would take UL life pay with the ACB death benefit rider to get me the highest rate of return because I know they're gonna do a loss carryback plan. If I was going to do, a, if I knew the accountants were going to be able to do a pipeline plan, in this case, I would have taken either the UL Life Pay or the UL ACB Beth and Ryder. They actually turn out to be the exact same IRR to the, to the uh, estate. Now, you might say to yourself, why is the UL performing so much better than the whole life options here? It doesn't always, because look at this, UL 10 Pay has the lowest performance in both of these planning options. It's just the way it worked out for this particular client different clients depending on their age, depending on the CDA that will be available from the product, it will differ. The other thing that will change is pricing on the products. I said this, these numbers were created for the purpose of this presentation a few years ago. The pricing on some of the products has changed and I've seen numbers for this recently. I'm sorry I don't have them in a presentation today, but we've generally found that the numbers have come closer together and you would expect that. If the actuaries price the products correctly, you know, the price of mortality, it shouldn't matter where you buy a whole life or UL. They should roughly work out the same. And the tax system changes since 2017 have also meant that from a CDA credit perspective, they're much closer together. Now you get some differences like um, UL with uh, YRT, that nasty YRT that we really hate selling. Um, it actually does pretty well on, on uh, CDA credit. So keep that in mind as well when you're doing your presentations to take a look at it, um, like a YRT 100. Um, but generally, I tell clients that if I've ever shown an accountant, for example, a slide like this, particular to their client, with their numbers, their age, all that sort of stuff, I point out to them, you know, any of these insurance options are good. What's wrong with an 8% guaranteed return for the next 20 years or 30 years? 35 years in this case. That's not bad, right? And you've covered off the mortality risk that the client dies tomorrow, right? Um, now, also note in this presentation, I've said age 85. And remember, I just told you that in our illustration capability now, we can show it every year. So it's not just at life expectancy, these are the options, this is how they perform. We can actually show it for all the years, okay? So the numbers could vary if you said, you know what? And what I say to clients often when I'm talking about insurance planning, I say, what do the, what are the, what are the um, underwriters know? You peed in a bottle, you gave some blood, you answered a few questions. But you know a lot more than them. And there's things they don't know. They don't know, for example, I think one of the most important things today is, well, what is the longevity in your family? How long did your parents live? So you can have two people who are standard rated from an underwriting perspective of the same health, health risk. But if one of them tells me both of my parents are still alive and they're almost 100, and the other one says they both dropped dead at 68, the one who's dropped it at 68 is, should see more value in the insurance because the family history shows that, that they died early. Um, now, the underwriters do ask questions if there was an early death for a particular reason, like a cancer or something like that, right? They want to know that. But just generally, assuming everybody's healthy and normal and lived to so-called normal life expectancy, did they die early or did they die young? So you as a client can make better decisions with your guidance than, than maybe the underwriters can. And that may direct you to different products because this is only looking at age 85, so-called life expectancy for this client. 
but what if we know that everybody in this family lives to the end of their 90s? Well, then, like we normally do, we'd run an illustration. We'd say, let's look at 90 or 95 as life expectancy. Again, with the planning, you may say, hey, the UL 10 pay looked really bad here, but in this client, it looks good, or vice versa, you know, any of these things. So keep that in mind. The other thing I want to say about the way this is presented is that at the first go-around with, with the people that designed it at Art Sun Life, they thought a good measure was this equivalent rate of return, and clients think that way. If you say this is like earning 10% on your money or 12% on your money, they understand that. But what we've seen from accountants is they think differently. Barry knows this. They think completely differently. So many life years ago at Kalu did a similar presentation, much more complicated, did it actually over two Kalu events year over year, where they presented numbers not in terms of equivalent rate of return, but in terms of what the accountants like to talk about, and that's tax rates. So uh, remember I said, you know, you got a double tax problem. It might be 73%. You might get a loss carryback and get it down to 47%. You might do a pipeline and get it down to 26 or 25 or 23%. If we add the insurance, how much farther can we get that tax rate down? And that's the way they presented it. And I said to our actuaries, you know, that's kind of a neat thing to do because clients might not appreciate it as much as the alternative rate of return method or measure. Um, but certainly the accountants like this. So if we're talking to accountants saying, you've done some great planning, you're planning to do some great planning, um, we want to show you how the insurance can add value, then we can talk in terms of the expected tax rate for the client, ultimate tax rate. And when you see those kind of numbers, it can be anywhere. It's going to be lower than what the accountants do on themselves, but it can actually go down as low as zero if you have the right amount of insurance, you don't have things like the stop loss, 50% rules affecting you, and, um, that's at the, and you do loss carryback planning. You, you can get it down to zero at the lowest amount. But there's a whole range of amounts you can get in there. And so sometimes I say to an accountant, okay, you've done this planning, you're expecting to have an effective tax rate of about 21%. I say, you know what, we can add this insurance and do this, we can get down to about 13 or 14, you know? And then they like that. They say, oh, how are we gonna do that? And we say, well, we're just gonna redirect some of the assets that are already in the corporation into a life insurance policy to create that CD credit, and we're gonna use it in this way. And it's important as you develop that, that um, rapport with the accountants to show them how you're working with them and their planning to use insurance to make what they're doing even better, you also let them know that you understand that what they're doing is valuable and that what they do is not necessarily locked in stone because it, it may not be available in the future, like pipeline planning might go away. The other thing I haven't told you yet is that the most efficient solution for most clients is not one or the other, it's both. So to the extent that a corporation has some CDA, either from insurance or elsewhere, to the extent that it's already got some RDTOH on the books, they should probably do a hybrid where they do loss carryback first to mop up some of the tax attributes within the corporation like CDA and RDTOH, and then pipeline the rest. And if you combine the two, you get a better tax rate than one or the other, okay? Um, you're never gonna explain that to the accountants. Hopefully they understand that already. But what you can tell them is that by adding the insurance, we give them more opportunity to take the hybrid approach. It gives them some insurance themselves, you know, it's a pun there. It gives them that if the pipeline goes away, their whole plan hasn't gone away, because now they got a backup loss carryback that can still be efficient with the use of insurance, but also even they can blend it. Because often we find in these cases, the clients are not fully insured. I mentioned this woman had a 78 year old woman had $36 million worth of shares, 35.7 million to be exact. She's only looking for nine million of insurance. Why? Because that's, what the accountant said the tax liability would be. So that's what the advisor quoted. So that's what we went into the meeting with. In the meeting, I said, you now understand how it works, so why aren't you buying 20 or more, right? More will work better, but it becomes a cash flow issue. So now in terms of how much and the type of products, UL versus whole life, um, it becomes a cash flow issue. And if cash flow becomes such a constraint for some of our clients, and they're a client with the right circumstance, the right frame of mind, that's when you might push over to the idea of doing it as an IFA structure. Because if they're having trouble cash flowing a million dollars of insurance, that's what the insurance was gonna be for this woman. Uh, it was anywhere from 680,000 to 980,000 a year. Then we gotta look for ways to help them out with that. And then we're starting the whole process again, determining the correct amount because we need the right net amount after the loan. 
We never went down the path of the IFA. We, we originally, the advisor had originally told them about it. They didn't think they were interested in that. We said, fine, we'd be glad not to have to show that to you. But we just want to make you aware that we're aware. So what I've, the conclusion here is that any insurance option, no matter what product you did, just throw a dart at a board, any of these will add value for the client. Understanding which is the best option is difficult because we don't know what the planning is going to be. But we can try to get them as close as possible. And using some sophisticated illustration software, you might be able to hone in on the one or two product options you're going to present to the client. This should give us a lot of confidence in this industry. Because as I said, I've run into a number of situations where advisors have come to me dejected and saying, I presented the insurance to my client. They ran it by their account, and their account's poo-pooing it, saying, I don't need any insurance because we're doing planning. You can now go forward confidently to say to that client, we'd like to set up a meeting with your account because I can show you that, in fact, yes, I, I understand roughly the type of planning they're suggesting. But adding a layer of insurance on top of that planning will make it better for everybody and make the accountant look like a hero as well. And the accountants shouldn't be threatened by that because the accountant's going to make their fees for doing their planning regardless, right? They make more fees as they analyze your proposal. Doing no planning at all is a costly option. Remember, no planning is having that standard will, everything to my spouse, and my spouse predeceases me, everything to my kids. Happen to have some shares. Now I'm dealing with double taxation on that. You should be able to disturb your clients with that just to make them understand that they can't rely on what's in their will. Just because they got a will, they think they're in their estate planning. That's just the start. And their will may actually be counter to good estate planning. And one of the problems with having that clause in your will is that you may say, okay, we know we got postborn planning options. We won't do what's in the will. That's not always possible either. Because when you sit at that boardroom table at the lawyer's office and they're reading the will and everybody's got their fingers going like this and wondering what they're going to get, what happens when someone says, hey, this is an efficient tax planning. Let's do something different. Everyone's going to say, whoa, 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 whoa. What's in it for me? I'm going to not, I'm not, because the only way you can do what's not in the will is have all the beneficiaries give consent. And unless, unless the executors have full discretion to, to manage this in their own way. So if it says everything to my kids equally after a spouse is gone, then you've got to get all the kids to agree. And maybe presented with all the hard facts, they will agree. But a lot of them won't get there. They'll be angry, they'll be confused, bewildered, you know, whatever. And, and they'll never get to the point where they're willing to give consent to doing something else. And also keep in mind, remember I said with lost carryback planning, the clock's ticking. You've only got one year to complete the plan to carry back the lost offset the gain. If you do that after the year's over, that's no longer on the table then you're only left with pipeline, and then you hope pipeline is still around then. Pipeline planning is popular today in part because it has no time limit. In fact, it's the reverse. Usually what happens is a pipeline plan doesn't happen the year someone dies. A pipeline plan might be extended over the next five years. And part of that is going back to what I told you about GAR, General Anti Avoidance Rule. Everyone in the industry recognizes that it's, it looks like aggressive tax planning, even though CRA is letting it happen, right? And they could turn it off at any time. So let's not poke the bear. Let's do it slowly. Let's not have a midnight special where mom and dad die at midnight. At 12.01, we create a new corporation. 12.02, we sell the new corporation to the old corporation. 12.03, we take back the promissory note. 12.04, we sell the assets. 12.05, we repay the promissory note, and we all walk away happy. You know, I call it the midnight special, meeting in the dark to do this around a table, and not doing what's in the will. That's the key part. You're saying, oh, we're not doing what's in the will. Let's everyone agree so we can all save some taxes. So what they do is they do a little bit at a time, maybe 15, 20% a year and spread it out over five years. The problem with pipeline planning can be for the family in many cases that they got to wait to get their money. So if there's a distribution of assets from mom and dad's estate, it may take some time and the estate's going to have to stay open for some time. Accounts love it. Lawyers love it. Because as long as that's open, they're billing, right? Um, so. The planning options themselves can sound complex. I hope today I made them sound a little easier to understand. You've probably heard them before. I just want you to internalize it a little better. They are subject to change. We, we, that's a given. But any insurance option that we can put in front of that client is going to offer significant value. Our challenge 
is to demonstrate that value. And hopefully at Sun Life we can help you with that, not only by putting the products in place, but providing some support like myself, like Jay on the underwriting side, and also with some of our illustration capacity that we've just come out with in the past year to help explain some of these more complicated things uh, to your clients and their centers of influence.